I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club, the podcast where we read the memoirs because we say, why can't I give you my opinion on these memoirs? And if you say, you can't, I don't want you to, well, then you can turn off the podcast. Because I am extraordinary if you ever get to know me. You guys remember that bitch? Her name is Liz Fair, and we're really going to delve into her horrific psyche today. And we're going to do our best to be fair, but to be honest, she's not my friend. I want to tell you guys something that I'm so excited about. What? Holidays. The holidays are just around the corner, like seconds away. I think that you can reach out and touch it if you wanted to. It's actually Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. The point is, if you want a good holiday gift, then you could get one because we have new merch out. Can I actually say Mac asked for the sweatshirt and t-shirt for Christmas and he's going to get it. He's having a CNBC Christmas for the rest of his life. How lucky. He actually did say, I love the new merch. Can I have this for Christmas? And I said, I think I could figure something out for you. I think I know a guy. I think I have a connect. This sweatshirt is different than our old sweatshirt. It's just a different material. And it's like thicker and cozier if you want like a real good winter sweatshirt. And the design is so beautiful, made by Hello Adrian. And we restocked our mugs. And if you are looking for a restock of the Very Smart Worm sweatshirt, that'll come eventually, but not right now. You'll be smarter next year even. So if anything, you'll grow into the brains it takes. And then Claire. Yeah. If you were writing a memoir, Mm -hmm. what would you call last week's chapter? Oh my God. I am such a (laughs) cornball. Okay. I'm really discovering a new side of myself and it's corny. (laughs) Cool. I got so into decorating my house for Christmas. I went bananas. I went to Target not once, but twice. You guys, Claire is so excited about her Christmas house in the way that sometimes I sit in the corner at a party and like look at photos of bug on my phone and smile. Claire was like (laughs) sitting in the corner and looking at photos of her Christmas decorations on her phone and smiling. We have a whole Christmas menagerie. We've got Lenny the Penny. He's a penguin. He is so cute. We've got Dina the Dino. She's a dinosaur. She's a Christmas dinosaur. I think next year we'll get Bonnie the Lamy. That's a llama. Oh my God. We've got Holly. We've got Jolly. We're going to get mistletoe. I've got candles. I've got ribbons. I've got colored lights. I have to say it's so full of joy. And then you know what else we got that we did last night? And this is like, I'm so embarrassed, but I guess me and Mac are really just like married. You guys are like married. It's a like, married yeah, couple. I know. And I'm like so embarrassed about it. We were in Target. He was like, they have everything. He's like, what, what else should we get? And I was like, oh my God, we got to get you out of here before you buy the whole store. And I was like, you're the memes. You're the memes of when you go into Target for just one thing and say, honey, I bought everything. Because we couldn't decide between the penguin and the dinosaur. And then, you know, me being bad, I said, let's just get both. You're crazy. And he said, okay, but nothing else. And then on our way out, he goes, oh my God, a gingerbread bus. And they had to make your own gingerbread bus. And so we got that. And I did that yesterday on our bus. Let me tell you, it's, it's MTA official in that it looks like shit. <laughs> But hey, I had so much fun. That's what it's all about. I like am down there and I come alive with magic. And you know what it is specifically? What? Here's the hack. It's not even like the Christmasiness of it. It's just the soft lighting. To be down, like watching TV, softly illuminated. Like lulled by a warm light is nice. It's really, it's the equivalent of having a ton of candles lit, except for easier and less dangerous. Totally. And that's really the hack of life. It brings me such joy to sit there and have a ton of little lights everywhere. (sighs) Especially when you can't go outside and it's so dark and you just romanticize your life. Decorate for the holidays. Ashley. Yes. Sorry I went on and on and on. If you were a celebrity and you were writing memoir, what would last week's chapter be? It would be called Know Your Limits. (laughs) I love Christmas cheer and I've had the opposite Christmas cheer week of you where I like over Christmas cheered and I'm in like a hell of my own making where I'm so overwhelmed. We have these holiday shows coming up. This is before the Christmas Spectacular, which I'm so excited about. And if you came to it, I hope you loved it. But I feel like I was like, we have to do a Christmas Spectacular. And so now we have this like whole project on our hands that is a bit overwhelming. And then I also like decided to print hundreds of Christmas cards of me and Bug and like individually address them to every single person who wanted one. And so I've been like addressing hundreds of Christmas cards and like reading all these books so that we can take like an actual break over the holidays. Did you know what I mean? There's just like a lot of things that have piled up that are like for the greater good of cheer, but are like stressing me out. That's valid. Well, you're a mother. Yeah, I'm trying to make the perfect Christmas for Bug. And that's different. That's a lot more pressure. 
I feel like that'll be the light at the end of my like kind of intense Christmas tunnel. Yay. So I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited about all these things individually. Every time I look at me and Bugs Christmas cards, I go, oh, this was a really fun thing to do. Every time I think about our holiday spectacular and I look at my fluffy dress, I go, this was a really good idea. But like the culmination of all of these things as tasks has been kind of a lot. And I like get how Santa feels. <laughs> he says this is an overwhelming thing that I've promised. Yeah, it's like being a host. It's like being Kathy Hilton. Yeah, to create magic for the whole world is actually kind of a curse. This week on the Patreon, we're going to do an entire holiday movie marathon review on the Patreon. So we're doing The Family Stone. We're definitely going to do um, that awful movie where everybody's in fake love. What's that called? I don't know. Yeah, you do. It's like the biggest Christmas movie of all time. Love Actually? Yes. Glug, glug, glug. What do you mean everyone's in fake love? Well, that's what you'll see when we watch the movie and I'll point it out to you. You'll have to listen to the Patreon to understand. I like Love Actually. Yeah, I'm about to destroy it in your heart. Actually, I don't want to. <laughs> And then do you know what else I want to watch? Because yeah. a lot of people have requested Christmas with the Coopers. Okay. And then also the gay one. Okay. Happiest season. Yeah. And then do you know what else I want to watch? Maybe for the week after. Okay. <laughs> that new one with Leeton Meester. We could add that. Well, I think you just come over with Bug and we spend all day just eating and watching TV. Okay. So we're going to do a full Christmas movie breakdown next year. Um, week. Yeah. To me, that's like a year from now because we have to do a performance between then and now. <laughs> Two. Anyway, we'll see you on the Patreon. The link is in the show notes. If you have any questions about how to sign up, let us know. Anyway, speaking of Christmas cheer, do you know who um, kind of dampened my spirit? Who? Liz Fair. Claire and I couldn't agree about whether or not to do this book, and I could not figure out why I didn't want to. And I think, like, spiritually, I was repelled by it. Like, the aura, the energy, the feng shui of this book was, like, already attacking your brain? Yes. Because I was shocked that you were so against it, because she seems, like, very up your alley Lilith Fair from 2003. Exactly. That seems like something you would love about her. Exactly. And I could not think of a reason why not to do it, so then we read the book, and it took me so long to get through, because I was so peeved by her the entire fucking time, and it took till the end to be like, oh, I actually really don't like her. So this is an essay book, more or less. Like, it's called a memoir, but it's definitely more of a book of essays. Mm -hmm. And each essay is just negative. Like, the energy radiating out of this book is whiny and bad. Yeah. I think that I have a particular problem with white women who think that in order to be deep, they have to just, like, talk about how much everything sucks and how bad things are and how much trauma they've experienced. Because I view it as kind of like a cautionary tale of like how not to be as a white girl who grew up upper middle class. It's very easy to become this. I understand where all of these stories come from. I just think her conclusion is always the worst possible scenario. I think this book is a really good example of the difference between self-absorption mm -hmm. and self-reflection. Yes. This book is very much a study of the self, which all memoirs, autobiographies are. But there's no underlying understanding of the patterns, where they come from. She pretends that this book is for others, but really it's just the Lena Dunham school of thought that if I just say the most honest train of thought in my brain, then that's vulnerability as opposed to being like, well, let's look a step deeper. There's no analysis. It's not thoughtful. It's not introspective. Yeah, it literally is just her saying the worst things that have happened to her, the worst things she's done, and the worst thoughts she's had. It's very like the first session of psychoanalysis where they word association. Yeah. I don't know where the growth is, and I also don't know where the understanding is. Anyway, so she says, I've been writing songs for 30 years. From the beginning, my songs have been my stories. Every time I recorded an album, I was writing my memoirs. Oh, I also want to say that this book is called Horror Stories, which like leans into the way that she like really believes in her own drama. And I'm like, nothing that happens is a horror story per se. I really se. thought we were going to come into this book with like a scathing review of the music industry and everybody who fucked her over. Oh, yeah. I'm like, you barely even know she's a musician from this. <laughs> Mostly, she's a girl without a boyfriend, which is the worst thing a woman could be on this planet. It doesn't matter how famous you get. It doesn't matter how talented you are. It doesn't matter if you pursue your passions to success. It doesn't matter if you connect with people around the world. It doesn't matter if you have a child. It doesn't matter if you have friends, if you have family. All that really matters is do you have a boyfriend? And that's the truth of your life till you die. Ain't it so? <laughs> My motivation for writing this book is to articulate those experiences that people may not always want to recognize, but describe them in a way that makes them worth the effort. By taking situations that are disempowering and then finding a way through the maze, I find that examining the weaker moments in our lives makes us stronger. 
in that, I don't think I'm alone. You're not alone, but I would not say that you find your way through the maze. Yes, I agree. I think that like there are certain bad thoughts and bad moments in here that everyone will recognize. But like the thing that we can all do to like improve the world is to not sit in those thoughts and feelings. It's to like grow from them. (laughs) It's a fine line because of course they are your memories. You are writing your own story. But when you truly want to write a story that helps other people feel less alone, you can't be 100% selfish. And in this book, she kind of is. Yeah. I will also say that another problem that I think you face reading this book is that it is just like story after story after story of overdramatic negativity. And it is grating when you read it in one sitting. I think I had this problem with Emrata's book where like every story is just like a little bit woe is me. And so then it's poetic and dark to try to prove how serious it is as opposed to allowing like the actual reaction of the reader to prove how serious it is. Yes. And like she really is just like, isn't this fucked up? And you're like, yeah, I guess it is. And reading all of these stories back to back literally sucks. And then the other thing that I want to say is like it is her truth and you are allowed to say whatever you want. And like I genuinely don't like that in a book. So if you liked this book, that is fine. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it is, in my opinion, a thing I don't like. Yeah. So she starts with chapter one. She lies. We left her there. That part haunts me. We saw her need and we ignored it. The bathroom was crowded. She begins to like go through this night. You can't tell what's happening, but she's explaining she's in college. She had been looking for a group of friends. She had been kind of invited to this group of girls because they all were friends and dating guys were friends and there was a single man in their group. So they set him up with him. They go on a couple dates. She doesn't like him. And then after it's clear that she's going to turn this guy down, the group phases her out. They were looking for someone specific. I I mean, and that's her projection. She projects a lot onto other people that I'm like, oh, this is like a very distinct opinion that you are projecting that I don't feel is backed up by a lot of the other details you've illustrated. So she's with these girls in a bathroom. It's instinct and that's that. Not everyone regrets the unkind things they do. Guilt is the poisonous flower that springs up after the selfish act. In order to grow, there has to be soil present to begin with. The most impressive blooms get pressed into your book of recollections and every time you go back and reread a chapter, their dry skeletal remains drop out and fall into your lap. I will say somebody in a review of this that I saw in the front of the book said it's like beautifully written without being pretentious. I actually don't find that true because there's a bunch of references in here that feel so pretentious and also like forced in like a yeah. double simile. Like there's this line where she goes, I was feeling as Gamine as Audrey Hepburn in Roman Holiday. And I'm like, that was a roundabout way of saying it. Yeah. So she in these essays bounces between memories. So you can conclude that all of these seemingly disparate memories that she's putting together have a similar theme. So she, in the middle of discussing this girl, we don't know what's happened to this girl in this bathroom that everyone just abandoned, but we know that that is the point of this chapter. She then hearkens back to another memory of a time that she was on a train, a man smiles at me and I sneer, like he's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. I'm scared. I'm 19 and I don't want to get raped. But as his face falls, I know instantly that he meant instead to reassure me that everything was okay. He was there. I was safe. If you think that's the bad part, it isn't. Everybody makes mistakes. My culpability begins the moment I turn my face away and stare out the window, pretending that I am better than he is. I let him know that I think he is repellent, allow him to sit there in shame and dwell on how poorly he was received. I mean, I don't think that that is a shameful thing to do. I think that if you are a woman alone in the city, you're allowed to like make a face at a man, even if it turns out he wasn't going to attack you. Because the best way to not attack a woman is to like not engage with her at all. If you're a man listening to this, you don't need to say, hey, lady, I'm not going to rape you. That actually doesn't make us feel more safe. Yeah. You could just go about your business and sit. (laughs) Just stay looking at your phone. The safest thing you can do for a woman on a train alone with you is just look at your fucking phone. Anyway, so then she goes back to the memory in this bathroom and what actually happened there that day. Some woman was so drunk that she died. No, we don't know that she died. She was lying face down, passed out, her head resting on the floor next to the toilet, a big smear of excrement extending out from between her sprawled legs. I never seen someone who'd shit themselves before, let alone publicly. The humiliation of it was extreme. There's something relentless about hindsight. I cannot exercise her from my conscience or purge her from my past. She will always be lying in that bathroom in my soul waiting for me. There's a lot of allusions to the fact that she will always be there, that like everyone walked over her, that like no one checked to see if she was still alive, that she like likely choked on her own vomit. I think she means to say that she died. She wasn't in the bathroom forever. She's saying she could have choked on her own vomit. I know, but I feel like the way that this is written, she talks about it like it was like later a thing that everyone talked about that like, wow, how many of us like stepped over this girl's body? Either way, there was a girl who no one helped. 
that was lying passed out in this bathroom while like everyone just like went to the bathroom and washed their hands around her and like left the bathroom. So even if she didn't die, she was like left helpless by a lot of people. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, it would haunt me too. I'd be like, damn, why didn't I do anything? And she's like, you know, no one in the group did anything. But that's not an excuse for me. The things in this chapter that stands out to me is this idea that not everybody feels guilty as if Liz is the only person who looks back on that night and regrets their inaction. That's the stuff I can't stand. This idea that like we're all doing the same thing. But for me, it was different. For me, I had this internal dialogue. I also can't stand the way that it's compared to that time she sneered at a man on the train. Those are different. To say that you left a girl dead on the floor is different than to like be very reasonably freaked out by a man on a train who says something to you or makes a face at you. You're you're allowed to not connect with strangers when you're alone. You don't have to feel guilty for not smiling back at a random man on the train. I do think that everyone who walked over that girl's legs that night like should carry that with them. And so I thought that this was going to like lead to moments in her life where she like started speaking out on behalf of people that she felt needed her help. And it like doesn't. No, it's just another moment that she's like, whoops. She also has this paragraph. I could tell by her shape and the quality of her skin that she was pretty, but she had to be lonely because where were her friends? Where were the people who were supposed to keep track of her? Where was the roommate or the boyfriend who was supposed to make sure she could stand up and get home? She must have come alone to that party. It must have taken courage, a lot of liquid courage, to stand around not knowing anybody. Her unconscious body on the floor was proof of just how nervous she'd been. No, it actually is not. Her unconscious body on the floor... Isn't proof that she was just like so insecure that she drank too I mean, it sounds like she might have been drugged. I don't know. Yeah, again, like we don't know what happened to this girl. Something about the fact that she's like looking at her now dead on the floor, I thought there's somebody with very few friends. I guess now that I think about how dramatic the rest of this book is written, I'm not sure that she died. As the first chapter, I feel like the writing was so dramatic about like the things I'll never know, the life that will never be. I was like, oh, she must have read in the newspaper the next week that this girl died. You know what I mean? But now I'm like, oh, she does write that way throughout the rest of this book. So maybe she didn't. But either way, like projecting that she is this lonely, insecure girl with no friends and no boyfriend, (laughs) the worst thing that could happen to you. Well, maybe not. Maybe she just said, you guys go home. I want to keep hanging out. And then she got too drunk or got drugged. The essay starts with her being like, I was looking for a new group of friends. I was so excited to be taken in by these girls. And the implication is sort of like, well, here's a girl no different than me, also so insecure that she came to this party looking for friends. And now she's passed out on the ground with nobody. Maybe something bad happened to her. I can't believe no one helped. (laughs) You know, when you see a girl who's so drunk with people where you're like, is it my place to like butt in and say, are you good? Yeah. Because you're strangers. That's so different than seeing someone like pass out on the floor soiled. Anyway. (laughs) Anyway, it's just a really interesting way to start the book. I guess from that chapter, I thought because I felt differently about her in the first chapter. I was like, oh, you know, this is a really vulnerable thing to admit that you did. This is a bad thing to have done. And so maybe this book will be about you learning to stand up for yourself and other people when it's not the popular thing to do. And that is not what this book is about. So we're going to skip around to some of the essays. We're not doing all of them. But the next one we're doing is called Magdalena. And it starts with her in the makeup chair, one of those canvas back director's thrones that are awkwardly tall and feel like they could fold inward at any moment. She is in some friend of a friend's loft taking photos to be in like a really cool downtown teens magazine. I'm guessing it's nylon. And a woman is doing her makeup absolutely sobbing. (laughs) Yeah. So this woman is sobbing. She says, like, are you okay?" And the girl's like, yeah. And she goes, that's New York City for you. You just pretend that people are fine. And that's privacy. And I'm like, that's actually true. That is true. Respect here is just saying, I don't see you crying. I'm not going to bother you about it. I know. I guess I've never been in a situation, though, where someone is like inches from my face sobbing. I feel like when you see someone on the subway crying, you don't ask. When you see someone walking and crying, you don't ask. When someone is literally applying your eyeliner. When you you are actively interacting with them, I think you're allowed to like check. Do you know what I mean? No, I agree. I agree. So anyway, she's talking about how she's coming to this photo shoot and the director of the photo shoot wants her to do a bondage. And if it had been a man, she would have been like, nope, guard up. Something's off here. That's not how I want to portray myself. But it's a pregnant woman. And she's like, well, what could a pregnant woman lie to me? No, she's look at her. She's a mom. So she goes for it. She's worried that she's going to back out. She doesn't know how she feels. But so far, she's letting people tell her how to be. And then she like doesn't want to do it. She's like, I wish I could tell them that I don't want to do this. But this girl is like crying in my face and I don't know what to do about it. 
So she just goes through with it. And with each costume change for this photo shoot, she's just going through the motions, like going with the flow. She does feel good in some of these outfits. She's like, I'm a biker bitch. I look awesome, actually. And then when she goes for a costume change, the makeup girl comes back. And while she was getting her photos taken in the first setup, the crying girl had like fixed her face, reapplied her makeup and was no longer crying. And so Liz's assessment of the situation is because it's raining outside and the girl had obviously gotten caught in the rain. She goes, oh, she wasn't crying because something bad happened to her. She was crying because her makeup got washed off in the rain and she was so insecure looking ugly. So she's talking about the photo shoot and she says, we're taking a risk by glamorizing suppression, but our gamble pays off. The shot of me bound and gagged will be chosen as the cover of the 1990s volume of Getty Images decade of the 20th century, representing a whole wave of indie feminism. A strong female artist with a bold voice shown silenced and constrained. Only a woman could have taken that photograph and maybe only a pregnant one could have conceived of it in the first place. So she's talking about doing this photo shoot and she says, in the end... I do it for Magdalena. I put on the low-cut dress that accentuates my breasts. One of the assistants ties my arm behind my back, crisscrossing my body with a rope that he loops twice around my neck. You might be saying, and who is Magdalena? So then she tells us who is Magdalena. When she was in high school and she was driving around in the back of a car with a ragtag group of kids, she, you know, is making out with her boyfriend. They're all a little tipsy. And there's a girl next to her who she like doesn't no. And she's like, who the fuck invited this girl? And the girl is being so weird. She was being like, do you have summer plans? And she's like, I wish. And she's like, I don't know what to do with that. that. What kind of answer is that? She's like, I wish I hadn't even asked this girl a question. I have no idea who she is. And she's answering every question so weird. And then finally the girl goes, this is my last night. And Liz is like, what do you mean? And she's like, I'm getting surgery tomorrow. And they're cutting half my face off. They're removing part of my nose and my jaw. The doctor says I'll never look the same again. She's like, remember what I look like? do you think I'm pretty? And Liz is like, I do think you're pretty. You're like actually so pretty. <laughs> and I will remember you forever. And she's like, and I do. The girl says, I wish I had taken more photos. I used to hate how I looked in photos. I wish this had never happened. I wish I'd never heard her story. I wish she'd never been there, but I just can't wish her away. Will you remember me? Will you remember how I look right now? She pleads with me, reaching for my hand. I will, I say. And I don't know what else to do to make her feel better. And I do, Magdalena, even to this day. It's so crazy that whenever someone speaks to her, she's like, I wish I hadn't opened that can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I hadn't seen that dead bitch in the bathroom. I wish I didn't know about that hot girl's newly fucked up face. In the first part of the chapter, when that girl is like sobbing in her face and she makes up a bunch of stories in her head. She's like, I think she was sad that her eyeliner was bad. And then later when her eyeliner is fixed, she's like, oh, she must have just been sad that her makeup had run. I mean, maybe if you had asked her, you would have accidentally opened up another can of worms that you like wished you could put back. You know, the worst thing that can happen to a man is his parents get divorced. But the worst thing that can happen to a woman is when they were 12, nobody wanted to fuck them. Truly, there is no bigger sin to commit against a preteen than being like, not yet, maybe later. <laughs> Girls hate that. To say, oh, when your braces come off and, you know, you go through puberty, they're like, what do you mean? I want every man, woman, and child to fuck me in my prepubescent state. And I will never forgive you if you don't. Ain't that the truth? So she says, what exactly are we evaluating when we think about our looks? Is it what's actually there? How people respond to us that shapes our opinion of ourselves? Can you describe somebody's looks without picturing the way they move, the sound of their voice, or their personality? If you break it down into parts, just the physical attributes, brown hair, brown eyes, round face, short, fat, pigeon-toed, is that really how they look? Or is that just shorthand for your much more nuanced and complex way of identifying them? So what are looks? Seriously, what are they? Okay, I actually have an answer. I think looks are how someone looks. I think you can actually describe how someone looks without describing how they move. And I think that sometimes based on someone's looks, you don't understand how they are. You're not describing the person. You're literally just describing how they look. And sometimes based on how they look, it turns out how they be is completely different. But looks are a very specific thing. And that is like what you see with your eyeballs. And sometimes your looks aren't necessarily your attractiveness. I completely agree. Yeah, I guess I do think that this like almost hits, but I'm like, no, looks are how you look. Okay. So I'm going to sum up this next chapter because it's kind of crazy. It's called Three Bad Omens. So she almost talks not at all about her career. You may be saying, how did you get from being just a kid in Chicago to a number one hit single? But she won't tell you. I don't even know when she learned to play guitar. I actually just found out she played a guitar when I Googled her recently. I don't know a thing about her. She talks about her guitarist. I didn't know she knew how to play the guitar. The only thing you know, I'll just like sum up what she says about her career in this book is at one point, 
she was in college, then she moved out to San Francisco and she's like burning these tapes called like girly music or something like that. And she's like writing songs and putting them on tape, but she's never performed live. It gets the attention of a record label. She gets signed. She ends up putting out an album. She was so nervous to play live and she like starts performing and eventually has a hit. And she doesn't like having to do like the pop star circuit. She wants to just kind of like make music and put out albums that she's passionate about. But like this is all spread out in every chapter through other stories. So if if you want to know about her career, that's all the career that's really in this book. So she is back in Chicago living with her parents after spending a year out in San Francisco. And then she runs out of money. She's back. She's bumming around. She wants to be a broke artist. So she's like figured out the broke part. And she's just hanging out with her friend. I think she thinks she's going to do comedy. She's this friend, Peter, that she knew from Oberlin, where she went to college. They met during an orientation because they were both the assholes in the group who thought they were too smart to orient themselves. She talks about how stupid it is to learn people's names. (laughs) <laughs> that's what they bonded over that why would we need name tags what does that tell you about a person um and their fucking name liz which she responds i could be friends with someone for months and not care what their name was if i could look it up i didn't want to make space for it in my brain i'd memorize data my entire life and i and never found it to be useful you've never found knowing someone's name to be useful you've never found any data to be useful <laughs> Also, like names are not data unless you're trying to like fill a database and like understand the percentage of people named Ash. Like, do you know what I mean? Like it's I wouldn't call like knowing my friend's name a data point about them (laughs) unless I was like conducting percentage of my friends whose name starts with C. Here's the thing. That is the most freshman orientation thought I've ever fucking heard. (laughs) Names aren't who you are. They're labels put on you by the fucking government. That's your mom and dad, bruh. Do we all hear the name Claire the same way when I say it? What are you hearing? I see the color blue. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, we were all dumb butts. We've all been to college and taken one psych course and gone home and told their parents how they raised us wrong. (laughs) according to psychology we've all been there but then you go to a second year of college and you go humiliating and i don't sense that she was humiliated i sense that she still thinks that that's like a pretty insightful thing to realize about people i think that she thinks the only humiliating thing because she talks about that girl in the bathroom being like she's like i can't imagine how humiliated this girl was and it's like okay so you don't think it's humiliating to be like names are data but you do think it's humiliating to be like That girl got herself drugged. (laughs) So she meets this guy, Peter. They become friends. Now it's like post-college. She's going over to Peter's house from her parents' house and she's driving down the highway. And she like is thinking to herself, what if something horrible happens? She goes, how crazy is it that we're all driving these cars so fast and nobody ever gets into an accident? Which is like an insane (laughs) thought to think because people get into accidents literally all the time. People be dying. And she she literally goes, it's so weird that no one ever gets into an accident when they're in the left lane, which is a crazy thing to say because <laughs> I don't actually know the distribution. That's data, like a name. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> but anyway, people do get in accidents in the left lane, including yours truly. Name a lane. Suck on that, Liz. That's breaking the glass ceiling. Liz Fair, <laughs> a former feminist, said nobody could get in a left lane accident. And Ashley said, watch me, bitch. Anyway, so she thinks this to herself. And then the car behind her spins out and gets into an accident. And she just keeps driving. And she's like, how fucking crazy was that? And so she gets to Peter's house. And she's like, you guys, I'm motherfucking psychic. I guess Peter had a pastor father. So he's very wary of religion and groups of mystical thinking. And so he's like, no, you're not. That's a coincidence. And somebody else is like, no, she's psychic for real, brah. And then for some reason, someone's playing with a hammer in the kitchen and they're just sitting there and he's spinning a mallet around. And she goes, wouldn't it be crazy if that mallet like blinded me? And as she's saying it, the head of the hammer disconnects from the mallet and hits her in the eye. Or it hits her in the nose and like breaks her nose. And then it turns out that if she hadn't like turned her head at that exact second, it would have hit her in the eye and like her eye would have fallen out of her head. But instead, she just like breaks her nose. Rolled like a meatball on top of spaghetti. (laughs) All covered in cheese. (laughs) After somebody sneezed. The eye? (laughs) Just roll off the table and onto the floor. And, and then, then my poor off. meatball. It went right out the door and that could have been her eyeball. And that's science. So she gets whomped in the face with this mallet and everyone is like, you might be psychic. But then she's like bleeding out of her face. And so she's like, I just want to go home to my dad. 
And they're like, what if you waited until you stopped bleeding out of your face? And she's like, nope, my dad's a doctor. He can handle my bloody face. I'm sure they think I'm crazy as I wave goodbye. I barely turn around. I'm literally running out of there. It's the end of an era. I'm sad to say this incident estranges Peter and me. They never talk again. I'm sorry. That is like a weird way to end a friendship. There's something so weird to be like, I had a near eyeball death injury (laughs) in your home. And like, I feel like that would only bring you closer unless you're crazy. Everybody thinks my song fucking run is about sex. And on one level, it is. But it's also about these moments when real connection and feeling is abandoned in favor of self-preservation. We come together and fly apart like colliding billiard balls because for whatever reason, we sense annihilation. I uh, I guess. (laughs) It's oh. just funny, like, no, there was collision here. Like, you collide, your head collided with a meat mallet. But did you sense annihilation? She's like, I had to get out of there for self-preservation. And I could never go back. I'm like, did he have a second meat mallet? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then she goes home and her dad's like, no, nah, your nose isn't broken. And then three days later, he's like, okay, your nose is actually so broken. So then she has to get it relodged. That's a whole thing. And then she talks about later being on a plane and the plane is about to land. And as they're like almost at the ground, all of a sudden the plane jerks up and starts flying back up into the sky. And she has like a psychic vision of what happened. What does she she thinks it's a nuclear reaction gone haywire that's going to radiate them to death. And she says it to her friend. And by friend, I mean stranger sitting in the seat next to her because she's like, by 32B as my witness, I swear to fucking God. Oh, yeah. She says maybe something's wrong with the power plant. (laughs) And then the pilot comes on the speaker and goes, sorry, guys, there was a flock of birds that we had to avoid. We'll try landing again in just a minute. And then she's like, fuck, (laughs) I wish it had been nuclear radiation. (laughs) She's like, that's how I found out I wasn't psychic. (laughs) Anyway, years later, Peter's brother brings the mallet head to a bar where she's DJing to get her to sign it. And she's like, that's so rude. And I agree. That's pretty rude. I think that's kind of funny. (laughs) It's funny. But I'm trying to find something good about Liz. And then she's like, it's so random. This other guy like wrote me a long letter saying that I abandoned all my friends once I got famous. But I don't think that's true. None of it is difficult to understand if you think like a pagan. We were the victims of three bad omens and they were real enough to scare me. What was the third one? The fucking nuclear power plant, Claire. (laughs) (laughs) That was bad vibes. (laughs) I await the next cosmic turn of events and wouldn't be surprised if we accidentally wound up in the same retirement community someday. Peter and I would pick right back up where we left off, laughing at all the other old folks wearing the stupid name tags, getting to know one another out by the shuffleboard deck. What? Let me tell you, me and the people who get to know each other by name, I'll take our way of life. Meat mallet free. Thank you very much. Anyway, this next chapter is called Labor of Love, and it is about having her baby. Nick. Nick. For some reason, Nick feels like such an adult name to me that even though she keeps on being like, I had my baby Nick, every time she refers to Nick in this book. Nick is not a baby. Right. Like, who's a baby named Nick? There is something so jarring about it. I'm like, there's got to be more here. Like, when she's like, Nick is in the back seat with a juice box. I'm like, oh my God, Nick, get up to the front seat like a fucking grown up. Grab a beer. I don't know when the name Nick started feeling very dated, but there's no more new Nicks. You can have a kid named Nicholas who like becomes Nick. And I think there's a short stop in the middle called Nikki. Yeah, sure. When you're a baby, you're a Nikki. This actually is, I think, a very interesting and well-written chapter. Can I say my most controversial opinion? That you hate childbirth? We have to stop telling other women what it's like to have a baby. The human race is gonna die. Every time I learn something, I go, well, I know why they hid that from me because I won't do it. Esther Pavitsky, the comedian, is pregnant right now, and she has a clip that she just posted on TikTok that I saw from her, like, set a couple weeks ago where she's talking about how, like, if she was honest about how she's feeling right now, she would halt the entire human race. No, I know. It's horrible. And, I mean, that whole Ali Wong special, that was my whole thing. And she's like, how come nobody's telling each other this? I'm like, because, Ali Wong, you have just halved the birth rate, okay? The birth chart is going to look like a goddamn funnel. There's going to be 19 people alive, and it's people who didn't subscribe to Netflix. Anyway, so she talks about how gross it is to have a baby, but she also gets into the fact that she was adopted. Which she mentions in one sentence in an earlier chapter, but kind of like leaves it hanging, which unfortunately, as this book goes on, I start to like think of those little moments as she didn't just like put that there because it fit with the story. She like dramatically dropped the nugget for you. She's talking about how she felt it was harder to be pregnant because there was no stories of pregnancy in her family, so she didn't know what to expect. 
At the same time, meeting someone who's related to me by blood is of immense interest. I've struggled my whole life with issues of identity. For as long as I can remember, I've pondered the existential questions of who I am and where I came from. The specter of abandonment has waited in the wings, lurking in the shadows, insisting on acknowledgement. And she does have abandonment issues and she does have identity issues. And so I would have loved for her to like explore any of this further. It is. It's just like a drop that then you could put together. But I guess I don't know what the point of having these like reflective asides or even essays. Yeah. I don't know what the point of having a reflective essay this is. This whole book is an aside. Later she goes, I mean, who cares, right? It isn't a big deal. There are much bigger deals in life, but it's my deal. And I've done my best to adapt. Can I say something? Everything and nothing is a big deal. If it's part of what made you who you are, I don't know. It's a big deal. And I already bought the book. So you might as well tell me your shtick. Yeah, I guess that's the thing is for her to be like, there are so many things that are bigger deals. To me, actually, in this book, nothing is a bigger deal than that. And it's a thing that goes unexplored beyond the immediate fact of I was adopted and that has made me question my identity. And then we see the ramifications of adult life. But there's never like an introspection there. There's never like an actual exploratory discussion of what it's meant at different points and the way she's addressed it. Anyway, she has a lot of talk in this chapter about how she feels like her vagina is its own thing and it's separate from her and there are two different people living there, which I didn't love, to be honest. Yeah, she talks about her vagina a lot. Another thing that happens in this chapter that she really doesn't explore or like even condemn is the fact that the anesthesiologist who's like helping with her birth, like managing her pain meds during birth, is a fan and keeps on like talking about her music to her while she's actively pushing out a child. I think she's aware that that's insane. I think she's using this comic relief in this chapter and yeah. not as like, here's a violation of privacy. <laughs> God, if there's one thing we can get you to believe from memoirs is if you are a doctor of any kind, surgery, birth, watching a parent die. These are not the times to bring up a concert you saw one time. Can I say, I think that there are a couple of times that celebrity doesn't matter. We are all just people. And that is within the bounds of a hospital. When life or death is on the line. And during 9-11. <laughs> she talks about how much she wanted to have a natural birth. She's wondering if it's worth it because it was so hard. And at the end of the day, it is. And then the end of this essay is about when she goes upstairs to take a shower, her mom's watching the baby and her breast starts spurting out breast milk and she doesn't know what to do. So I am horrified and I have absolutely no idea what to do. Tears spring to my eyes. I cry out for the one person I depend on above all others. Mom. So I think that's supposed to thematically answer the question of what does her adoption mean to her about her own journey in motherhood and her own sense of self. And it kind of neatly ties it up. Like at the end of the day, she's still my mom. And I'm like, true. But at the end of the day, you seem to have like some real issues. And I would love to dive in more. I don't think the way that this essay neatly ties up that question of her adoptive identity. I don't actually think this is a neatly tied up theme in your life. So yes. let's not pretend that it is. Totally. God, then she writes one of the more annoying essays I've ever read in my life called New York City Blackout. Oh, no, this is not it. Sorry. She has a New York City blackout and a New York City blizzard. The blizzard I can't stand. The blackout is just like a story. So she was in New York on tour and it was during the great blackout of 2003. I remember it well. Greatest day of my life. Every single store in America was handing out ice cream for free. She talks about that. I know. And, and let me tell you, when I was 11, it was huge. <laughs> The only problem was you couldn't eat their free ice cream. You had free ice cream at home. <laughs> They're melting ice cream. We've got melting ice cream. Everyone's melting ice cream and just lapping it up as best you can before it's soup. So there was a blackout. They were supposed to have a concert. Instead of having a concert, they just hung out in the city because you can't have a concert if there's no power. And then she was walking around town with her guitarist, who she had a huge crush on, even though he had a girlfriend. And she was like, the fact that he wanted to spend the blackout with me meant that he like liked me back. And I'm like, okay, I think that you guys were just like on tour together and didn't really know that many people in the city and didn't have that many ways to contact anyone you might know in the city because of the blackout. Like it does seem like they liked each other. Yeah, I mean, they did end up dating. They did end up dating, of course. But like if I was like with a friend that I had a crush on and then all the power went out, I wouldn't be like, oh, he must be in love with me. I also just was bored. I don't know. It really was an entire essay about the night that the power went out and running into somebody from the Dandy Warhols. And that was kind of cool because I love the Dandy Warhols. He's very smart. He thought of having a helmet light. Yeah. And then like she was like, we got to stop talking to this guy from the Dandy Warhols and go find headlights. So they did. I don't know. Ultimately, she's getting her makeup done for Good Morning America the next morning. And she says to the makeup artist, I don't know what to do. I have a crush on a guy, but he has a girlfriend. The makeup artist smartly goes, well, do they live together? 
And I agree. That's quite a boundary that then complicates somebody's life. And she goes, yes. And so the makeup artist goes, okay, then don't do anything. They end up breaking up and she gets together and she says the relationship was very toxic. So, Okay, so this next chapter is about a break-in at her house when she was in college where I do feel that she was let down by the administration and she was right to have her like personal safety feel violated. So she was at home asleep. She was living with a bunch of people that were kind of random on an off-campus house called the Blue House. Something wild about Oberlin is they'll let you rent for $5 authentic Picasso's, Renoir's, Matisse's, Monet's, Warhol's. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, so she's home one night. It's late and she hears three men come in and she thinks it's her roommates, but then she can hear their voices and she's like, those don't sound like my roommates. And then she starts hearing smashing and they're clearly rummaging through the kitchen and just smashing these authentic paintings. They're breaking plates. They're just running things. They're looking for a knife. They're going up and down. She is terrified for her life. Someone has broken into her house and is smashing shit. So she jumps out the window and runs to a phone booth to call the police. It's like one of those campus safety booths. Do you know about? Did you have these at school? No, our school was all within shouting distance of each other. There was like these pillars that have a blue light at the top of them. So you can see them from very far away. And then you don't have to like dial anything or call anything. You just like pick up the phone and press go and it connects you to like campus safety. So she jumps out the window and runs to these new campus safety booths and she calls campus <laughs> new campus. Sa- I feel like you're their mascot. <laughs> well, she says that it was new because she's like, we had just had a big take back the night rally and they like just installed all these safety booths. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. Everything she's saying is true. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're like anti-campus safety. <gasps> I'm not. I just Claire, if you have a better system, go to town. I don't. Call Hello Oberlin. Claire has some notes about your new booths. Anyway, so what was interesting? She's run, but the time the police get there, the guys have fled, and now she's left with a moral quandary, which is based on the sound of their voices. She thinks it was three black men, and she goes to a hyper liberal arts school in Ohio, and she's very aware of what kind of accusation it is to say I didn't see them, I don't know anything about them, but I think that they're black, and she's like very guilty. And she's like, I can't start a witch hunt for just like three random black guys. So maybe I shouldn't say anything. Can I say, though, it seems like she's more concerned with not identifying these men as black, but by people finding out that she identified these men as black in case it turns out they're not. Yeah. Anyway, it does turn out to be three black men from the school basketball team. You know what's so weird? Okay, she goes, even though I'm white and middle class, I don't sit in the lecture halls thinking history is my story. I don't feel like my future is in any way guaranteed. I expect to work twice as hard to be acknowledged in the art world simply because I'm female. How does that make me the oppressor? Why shouldn't I say who I think the assholes who broke into my house were? They broke the law, but now I'm feeling guilty. Okay. She has a lot of the first thoughts that I think a lot of us have. And I won't rope everyone in. Mm -hmm. But like, I think that I identify with and understand a lot of these thoughts as a jumping off point. And then you like, Grow up and take accountability and like and read, learn more. You read those data points she hates so much. Yeah. And you see, actually, like you're not the biggest victim in the world. So when I read these words on a page, I'm like, OK, this is not necessarily a wrong thought to have had at some point if you then learned more things. Yeah, I guess the first time I read that paragraph, I kept expecting like a second half to it. But now that I've read it, there wasn't a second half to it. Like I get being like when I was a young, selfish fucking idiot who like had not experienced the world. And I was like in my little echo chamber of Oberlin Liberal Arts College. This is what I believed. And now I understand that that is The irony is that the echo chamber she's in is like this super progressive place where they're trying to make this exact type of person, the rich, white, upper middle class girl, realize that she is not the center of the universe. And they fail big time. So interesting. All it did was make her feel more sorry for herself. Yeah. Interesting. It's an interesting takeaway. Anyway, so then she gets into how sad her life really is. And you have to understand all these random roommates she has are like trust fund babies. And they're all so rich. And her dad is simply a doctor. (laughs) You don't get it. They're rich. I'm just upper middle class. Anyway, so what it turned out had happened was the worst of them all, the trust fund baby named Whitney, had had sex with one of the basketball players' girlfriends. So in retaliation, they came and they smashed up their shit. Which is fucked up. I'm sorry, but that girl is not your property. It's not like a plate for a plate. You cannot, because someone hooked with your girlfriend, break into somebody's house and break all their shit. She was very right to be afraid for her life that night when someone broke into her house and started breaking stuff. Like, that is very fucking scary in a way that makes you feel unsafe in your own home. 
it's not great to hook up with somebody's girlfriend, but I will say when two consenting adults do something, you don't get to then go and like do theft and shit. Yeah. I also want to clarify when I say it wasn't a wrong thought to have had. I mean, it like if it is a thought that you had, it's not. You get to have a second thought. And so what is like the normal thing to do if you're going to write a book about these thoughts is to not then like plant yourself in that space. It's to like explain how you had that thought and now you recognize like it's very Lena Dunham to be like, well, this is what I thought. And now what do you think? Yeah. And what's the reflection and what's the perspective and what's the growth and what's like where are we at now? Yeah. And it seems like where she's at now is still there. <laughs> I will say what those guys did, I think, is really wrong. Me too. I think it's not a great person to hook up with somebody's girlfriend for fun. But it is actually, like, unacceptable and wrong to break into somebody's house and smash all their shit. So the school decides... That because it's, like, I guess, I don't know if it's the it's basketball the bas- team. It's the basketball team. And they don't want negative attention. So they decide nobody is in trouble. The insurance program will actually pay to restore the works. But Liz Fair and her roommates are on the hook for paying for all of the broken frames and stuff. And she very rightfully is like, I'm not on the hook for this. How the fuck am I on the hook to pay? I simply live there and someone broke into my house, smashed shit. And now I owe money for school property. And I guess because Whitney was like the gang leader and he was just like, whatever, just pay for it. I don't care. I guess he was feeling a little guilty. Everybody else was like, that's fine. We'll pay. And she did not like confront the school about it at all. And so she said to Whitney, well, you have to pay for my half. And he goes, no. So then she's like, okay, the least racist thing I could do is go treat these guys the way I would treat a white guy. I'm going to tell them they have to pay. So she goes to this house during a party and goes up to one of the guys and is like, you owe me money. And he's like, I'm not paying for that. And she's like, that's not fair. You broke it. He says, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. I'm sorry that I lost my temper, but I'm not paying for the damage. He looks at me, but it is in a cold stare. He's showing me where his line is. I hold his gaze trying to convey that I too am aware of that line. I know I deserve better. But for some reason, his apology and acknowledgement are enough. Maybe that's what I came for. My heart feels lighter. I'm not sure what currency he just paid me in, but I think he offered me respect and I can live with that. What? I don't know what the fuck this story was about because I actually do think we need to talk about colleges and the way that college administrations in this country will like let women be burnt to hell before they get any bad press. And like, I don't know. I think as an adult, you get to look back and be like, a lot of people failed you. (laughs) Listen, I will say like running to your parents, you're still in college. You're kind of still allowed to like if you need someone who like pays tuition to call the school. Yeah, the guys should have gotten in trouble, but the school decided they weren't going to be in trouble. So now you can go to the school and say, then you're responsible for your own school property if you're going to decide that the people who actually broke it didn't break it. The school wasn't good to her. And she like talks later about some sexual assault she experienced that she like tried to report to the school. Like we'll get to that. I mean, I'm like, yeah, it was a bad school. It's such a weird story. Okay. This next essay, also pretty damning of Liz Fair. So she is flying first class from I think Prague to Heathrow and then Heathrow to Chicago. Anyway, she's on the flight and she hates being famous. Who would have guessed that Liz Fair was this famous? But according to her, she was so famous. She was getting paparazzi everywhere. She never could leave her house without getting people's attention that fans waited for her at her gate. So she's on this flight and the flight attendant comes up to her and is like, hey, someone in the back of the plane says they know you. And she's like, oh, my God, what? And it turns out it's like a guy who went to her elementary school. She was famous for the tragedy. So, you know, in every town, there's a guy or a person where there was like some thing that happened and the whole town talks about it. And even if you haven't seen them in a long time, you're like, well, I'm aware of what's happened. So this is the guy in her town and she doesn't say what the tragedy is, but she is talking about how annoying it is that everybody always recognizes her and looks at her. And here he comes on crutches. Hey, Liz, how's it going? This is pretty crazy, right? I couldn't believe it when I saw you were on this flight. He accidentally knocks the person next to him off balance. What are you doing in Europe? Playing some shows? And he keeps going on. And he's like, that's so amazing. I saw you in Rolling Stone. I've been meaning to catch one of your gigs, but I've been competing on the wheelchair tennis circuit. The training schedules are nuts. And I have a lot of interviews. Listen, can you do me a favor? I need to make a tight connecting flight. And as you can see, I have my hands full. Can you carry my leg for me to the gate? Okay. So she thinks that she's like, I'll be a good person today and I'll wait for him when we get off the flight so that he can take a picture with me. Wait, I need need to find the one. Yeah, I have it. I start planning what I can do to make this a quick and positive experience for Jake. We'll get somebody to take our photo and then he can dine out on that story for the next couple of weeks. I'm pretty well known at this point. So bumping into me ought to net him in an eager audience. He probably doesn't get out that much and will be a boost to his self-esteem. So anyway, so then he comes crutching up and he's just like yammering, having a good time, catching up. And honestly using her. He does not care that she was famous. He cares that here's somebody that's not a stranger that I can ask a favor of because 
Because he needs to get through the airport. It's easier on crutches than to like wait for a flight attendant or like a flight person to handle a wheelchair. But what he usually does on these flights is he'll just like ask a stranger to help carry his leg when he's on crutches. And she's like, it's no small feat. Like she's 5'2 and I guess he's 6'2 and his leg is most of him. So she's carrying this big leg. So he sees her and he's like, oh, I can just ask someone I know who already knows me to just carry my leg through the airport. And she spends the entire chapter talking about like what an inconvenience this leg is. She's like, I'm so small and this leg is so big. So then he's like, thanks a lot. Gets on the plane. He's like, it's good to see you. Hope to catch you soon. I watch him for a second longer than wander off somewhat dazed, feeling like I've been through a car wash. I make it onto my next flight without an incident. As we're taking off, I realized that neither of us even mentioned the fact that he'd lost his leg, even though I hadn't seen him in years. That is so crazy to be like, he didn't mention it. He just asked me to hold a prosthetic leg. But also to be like, was her plan to be like, hey, how's it going? I haven't seen you in a decade. How is that trauma? <laughs> I'm sorry. When you see somebody for the first time in a while, you don't open with their trauma. <laughs> okay. I guess I'm wondering what she thinks mentioning the leg looks like. <laughs> because he did hand her a leg. <laughs> <laughs> so like, do you think he should have been like, hey, haven't seen you in a while. FYI. I don't know if you've heard, but I did get into an accident and lose a leg. And now I have this fake leg, which you wouldn't have understood what this was had I not given you the backstory. <laughs> he correctly assumed being from the same hometown, I already knew. He correctly assumed that being handed a leg, you could assume he just like only had one. <laughs> I've heard his story multiple times, how he tried to cross the street in Boston, but misjudged the speed of an oncoming trolley car. He's famous and he accepts it. Can I say... Again, the projection of it all. I don't know that he's famous and he accepts it. Maybe he assumes that you, as Ashley has said, have correctly figured out the amount of info that needs to be known. And maybe he thinks if you don't know the story of his leg, you're not entitled to know it. Maybe he doesn't walk around feeling the need to explain to people their discomfort with like the context. I don't know what a business it would have been. You're somebody he knew. He needed a favor. He doesn't owe you like a shitty accident. This idea that she's like, the only reason he didn't immediately tell me exactly what happened is probably because he knows that I know. I'm like, or he was in a rush and he'd rather say, how are shows going? Here's what's going on with me. What's going on with him is not a freak accident 10 years ago. What's going on with him is that he's like a wheelchair chess champion and very busy. Tennis. What did I say? You said chess, Clara. <laughs> Everyone in chess is sitting in a chair of some kind. Wheelchair tennis is like deeply impressive. Not that wheelchair chess wouldn't be impressive, okay? <laughs> I just think wheelchair chess is the same as chair chess. <laughs> <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. She like goes on to be like, why do I always feel sorry for myself when it doesn't seem like Jake feels sorry for himself, even though his life is obviously worse because he lost his leg. And I'm like, it seems like his life isn't worse. It seems like he has a very fulfilling life. I have a long time to think about that. Why I feel like a victim, a captive to my celebrity in need of velvet ropes and special treatments. Sometimes I look at my friends and family and think you just don't get it. You don't understand what I have to deal with. But there's no way I have it worse than Jake does. I begin to wonder if it's all an excuse, a way of blaming my loneliness and antisocial tendencies on the scapegoat of fame. Can I say, I don't know Jake's story, so I hesitate to jump to this conclusion. But from what I know about Liz, she definitely has a worse life than Jake does. <laughs> While I've been folding myself up into a pity party picnic basket, Jake has willed himself to be more capable, less careful, less isolated. Maybe all I needed to do was stop thinking about myself for five minutes. Maybe. Yeah, probably. She does go on to be like, I actually do love flying first class, though. I'll never give this up. And then she says, Jake is like a laser beam that reminds her to be less self-absorbed and to be a good person and to try harder. The good people of the world are those who, in spite of there being no payoff, do the decent thing anyway. That's what being a human is. That's the example of a human being. I don't think he was showing up being a good or bad person either. He just was a human being who had to get to another gate and ask for a favor. This moral thing of like, you're a fucking hero, bro. Because then she also talks about getting off of the first class plane and getting to go in front and how she feels so amazing walking with all these other guys in suits. And like, they're the success people. They're the winners. They're elite. And then they all run to get the first place in customs. And she's like, oh, my God, they're animals. Being in first class doesn't make us better than them. Girl, I know. <laughs> I never thought people in first class were better than me. I definitely never thought Liz Fair was better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that she's right in that like being a good person means just trying your best every day regardless if there's no like reward for it. It's just how you have to be. Yeah, but that's what I mean for this book is like she's constantly coming to these conclusions about like being one with nature and like respecting humanity and like being good to one another. But I'm like, but when did you do it? 
I just like don't love that her takeaway was like, oh my God, that guy's life sucks. I'm yeah. so lucky. You don't know him. You don't know him. It seems like he's doing good. <laughs> he's in Croatia playing tennis. That sounds fun. What am I doing? I have the worst life. <laughs> Nobody's ever talking about how much my life sucks. <laughs> all you have is a Christmas penguin and a dream. That's literally all you've ever wanted. And I'm happy for you. Okay, so this next chapter is crazy. Her friend calls her and is like, I'm cheating on my husband. And Liz is like, fucking don't do that. Trust me, it doesn't go anywhere good. I've done it and it sucks. And her friend is like, how fucking dare you? Her friend thought that she was going to call and confide in Liz and Liz was going to be like, yes, bitch, sounds sexy. Get it. But instead, Liz goes, Kelly, you've got two kids and no way to support yourself. (laughs) I shuddered when I read that. I'm not saying you have to stay with Brian, but you need to be honest with him. Tell him what you're feeling. Even if he gets mad, you'll have a chance to work out things in the future. If you go behind his back, there's no way to repair it. And believe me, it's hard being a single mother. You don't want to end up like me. Promise me you won't do it. Imagine being like, I don't care that you don't love your husband. You're broke. You'll be poor. (laughs) In this economy? (laughs) An affair? No, no, no. It's literally the worst kind of person. Like, it's the kind of person that I get so mad at. Like, you know, when I go to all those weddings and they go but you're single? Are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like kind of living my dream and I have a beautiful dog. So that part is like really good. And, you know, finding a relationship would be nice. But like overall, I wouldn't call myself miserable. (laughs) It's better to be miserable and coupled than happy and single. Because when you're single, you have no value. I agree that advice should be don't cheat on your husband. Like I do think cheating on your husband is not a good thing to do. But I don't think the advice should be because if you don't have a husband, you'll have nothing. It should be like, if you're not in love, break up with your husband. And so then she gets into her affair. So you can, but I can't. Her marriage wasn't working. And she had this flirtation with this guy, Ethan. Who was her manager. And then they had like a steamy makeout. And then after their steamy makeout, her neighbor comes over and like gives her a Bible. And she's like, that's so random. And I'm like, well, he probably saw you. And she's like, to this day, it was the most profound moment of connection I've ever had with another human being. And I was like, with your neighbor, the evangelical? He comes to her with this whole shtick about like everything bad I was doing. I was a drunk. I was stealing. I was a cheat. I was a liar. I was a scoundrel. And an old man came up to me and said, take this Bible. I was just like you. You're not beyond redemption. Jesus is always there. And I took the Bible and I threw it in the back of my car and I never read it. But then one day I started thumbing through it and he saved me. Jesus saves. And he goes, as bad as you feel, you have it. I've had it worse and I've been there. And Jesus is always there for you. And he says, you just take this for when you're ready. And then guess what? It turns out her and her manager did not make a good couple. And it turns out they both blew up their whole families for like literally no reason. But everyone moved to California. And she's like, I'm not the devil. I'm just a human who made a mistake. Yeah. But like one time she has a dream where it turns out this guy that she's cheating with is the devil. And instead of seeing that as profound and being like, I shouldn't fuck him. She goes, I guess I'm the devil's mistress. I hate how much pain I caused everybody. Ethan and I never asked anyone to lie for us or cover for us, but it happened sometimes because we were so damn sloppy. Looking back, it was almost as if we wanted to get caught. When you expect to be punished, but you're getting away with it, it feels worse than nothing happening at all. You start subconsciously looking for a higher power to step in and restore balance to the world. Otherwise, everything you've been taught and everything you believe in is meaningless. Life is random. There's no justice. And that, as it turns out, is psychologically unacceptable. Isn't that exactly the conclusion she came to in the last chapter with the leg guy? I don't know. She literally was quoting Camus, the plague, and being like, things are random. There is no justice. All you can do is try to be a good person every day for the sake of it. And now in this chapter, she's like, if there's no God, then what? Okay. And then the last line in this chapter is so fucking dramatic and dumb. She goes, so you don't believe in the devil? That's good. I'm happy for you. The devil did not make you cheat on your husband. You're just like not an empathetic person. She's not compassionate in any way. Or can I say I would have more compassion for her if she explained what happened? Because all she says is like, yeah, I made my husband marry me. It was really important to me and he didn't want to lose me. So we did it. And then I don't know. One day it's just like marriage wasn't what I thought it would be. And uh, then I started hooking up with my manager. And I'm like, well, what went wrong? What did you think it was going to be? She's like, we just grew more and more distant. And as I was having an affair, he could feel it. And I started accusing him of cheating more and more. And that made him mad. And I was just like, but what was like the problem underneath it? And like, What in you made you want to get married? I don't know. It's just so weird because she goes from nothing to suddenly she's getting a divorce because of an affair. And I'm like, well, I need a middle. I wish I could hear genuinely what went wrong there. I guess I would feel compassion for people if they explain their perspective. Well, I don't think she's ever looked at her own perspective because she mentions having like identity issues and abandonment issues. 
And I think that those go hand in hand with these partnerships with other people and what you think they're going to be like. I think that sometimes you think that a partnership will bring certain qualities into your life that it can't because that's not what partnerships are. And so if she explored those feelings of like what she was projecting into like what a relationship should be, I would care a lot more. Her attempt to be poetic and bring in this devil imagery. Stop. Just sit down and tell me what happened in plain language. I think we'd get further. Yeah. So then this next chapter is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Nothing's made me angrier. It's an entire like 20 page chapter about a time she did a show at the Music Hall of Williamsburg. I'm very familiar. I believe it's North Six and like Driggs or something. Maybe Kent. Anyway, so this whole chapter is about how she is in Williamsburg and there's a blizzard. And she was specifically told, make sure you have a car ready to go because of the blizzard. It's going to be really hard to get out. And she's like, drama. <laughs> and then, of course, the car can't get across the bridge because of the blizzard. And she spends like hours being like, what do I do? Well, can I say specifically right after the concert, one of her bandmates goes, do you want to come stay at my hotel? And she's like, no. And he goes, we're going to stay in Brooklyn because it's going to be impossible to get back to Manhattan. And she goes... I don't care. She goes, I can get a taxi. They go, it's a blizzard. Nobody can get across the bridge. There are no taxis. And she goes, I can. Watch me. Guess what? She couldn't. And then in all the hours she spent trying to figure out how to get out of there, all the hotels booked. And then finally someone says, well, the train's still running. So now it's 2 a.m. and she has to figure out how to get to Manhattan, which is not hard. You take the L to wherever. She's going to Flatiron. She's staying at the Flatiron Hotel, which takes her a really long time to figure out. She keeps saying triangle building and Flatiron is a grid. Once you get into Manhattan, that's very easy. And then you just take the train up. Even if you just got off the L, it's like a couple of a block a walk. But yeah, she could have gotten off the L at Union Square or 6th Ave. Or she could have gone from Union Square one stop up on like the N or the R. And she would have been directly in front of the Flatiron building. Anyway, this whole chapter is about how proud she is of being able to figure this out and navigating it. At one point, she's like walking around Manhattan looking for the hotel. And she's like, I pull out my phone and use the GPS, worried that my phone could die at any minute. I was like, bitch, you had GPS this whole time. It's a grid. Figure out where you are based on your dot on the GPS. And then just like walk three blocks up, one block to the left or two blocks up, one block to the right. I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but it's not more than three blocks. And it's, again, a grid. So another thing she's super concerned about is getting to her show in Virginia the next day. And she's like, for the love of God, I hope the snow lets up so we can get to Virginia for the show tomorrow. If you are in New York for one night and leaving first thing in the morning and playing in Williamsburg, why would you not stay at a hotel in Williamsburg? Like, why was she staying at the Flatiron Hotel? I don't know, especially if you're commuting back and forth to LaGuardia. If you're flying in another LaGuardia, I don't know. It's like a 10 minute drive. Okay, Liz, if you're listening to this, <laughs> explain yourself. <laughs> So this chapter is about how she like almost froze to death in the middle of New York City during a blizzard because she was like too stubborn to listen to anybody. (laughs) No, this chapter is about how proud she is of like finding out she had the skill she didn't know she had, which was, I guess, just navigating. But not even with a GPS (laughs) and a grid system. And also her friend had walked her to the subway because she didn't think she could find the L. And like the truth of it is that this is actually a mess that she got into because she was too stubborn to listen to a single fucking person. And there is like absolutely no reason she should have been in this situation also she's like it reminded me that i can do things which was great because i was really reeling from a horrific breakup not the husband a new guy rory who she calls a sociopath in this next chapter so rory let's talk about rory so we talk about the beginning of their relationship she's like he was so charismatic and wonderful and i was obsessed with him and then she goes there were red flags though Hold on. Well, first I want to say like the thing that she thought was so wonderful about him was he was hot in a way I guess she doesn't normally date. He was like charming. It seems like he was a real alpha popular stud. And she always felt that he was a little bit above her because of how charming and good looking he was. And I'm like, Liz, fair. You have that one song from 20 years ago. You're just as good as any guy out there. But you really can't get past the fact that at 12, no one wanted to fuck you. It is one of the stupider things you can do in this life to give too much credit to someone just because they're hot. I'm sorry. You can't do that after the age of like 17 and a half. I'll give you even 29. (laughs) And then you have to stop. But Liz, you can't have a kid and a divorce under your belt and still be like, but his muscles are so big. (laughs) I guess I did date that like really hot mean guy when I was like 24. He was so hot. It was crazy. Let's talk about the red flags with Rory. So she says on the surface, Rory and I get along well. We have a natural rapport that's playful and instinctual. He's charming and adept in social situations. And I'm finally in step with my married friends. If he's selfish or cold occasionally, I rationalize it as the prickly ego of an alpha male. And if I'm being strictly honest, I take a bit of pride in it. Can I say something? What? Her obsession with being able to fit in with her like married friends is so crazy. Because first of all, you live in LA at this point. Surely you know other singles. And the other thing is, 
she is like obsessed with being like, I don't fit in with my rock and roll friends because I'm not gay, but I am too rock and roll for the suburbs life. Well, I think that she says straight as in like, Straight and narrow. Straight and narrow. I know. I heard it twice. I think she means like she's not gay enough to hang. I'm like, okay. I don't know. I think surely you can find a middle ground. Okay. That's so weird. So she talks about the red flags in their relationship. My subconscious had been trying to tell me something, knocking at the door of my awareness with symbols and metaphors that spring to mind spontaneously. But when you're holding your hands over your eyes, it's hard to read the signs. At a wedding weekend in Napa, one of Rory's friends accidentally spilled red wine on me at the reception. That is not a red flag. Like the spirits telling you like this is danger ahead. You just said that he becomes like randomly prickly and mean to you, but you like being with him because you like having a partner for couples game nights. That's the warning sign that he's mean. Not that one of his friends spilled wine on you. <laughs> Your friends with the butterfingers? Uh-oh. <laughs> Douchebag alert. Why were you wearing cream to a wedding? <laughs> yeah, she says her cream dress was suddenly stained like she was Carrie. And I'm like, okay, that seems like too light of a color for a wedding, my friend. The other warning signs, his mother didn't like me and her mom just tolerated him. That's a red flag. I don't know, man. If one of your friends spilled something on me, I don't know that we'd ever talk again. <laughs> anyway, she pushes forward because... She walks with more confidence in the school pickup line, especially when Rory is with me. I swear to God, if you're a fucking single mom, you should bury your head in some damn sand. I'm grateful to be able to shed the label of single mother for a while and imagine that the other women envy me rather than pity me the way that I feared they usually do. It is impossible to express the sense of relief I feel having the protection of a man in my life again. Ew. Later, the way she cleans out her closet is fully based on whether or not she thinks a man would like to touch this kind of cloth. Yeah, she goes, I pick up my clothes and I imagine a, a man wrapping his arms around me when I'm wearing this shirt. Would he like it or no? <laughs> Liz, uh, <laughs> this is awful. You can't keep calling yourself rock and roll when you're just like, I just want a boyfriend. Also, just like the projection of it. There is no way that in Los Angeles, she's the only single mother at that school. So the fact that she's like, oh, yeah, when you see a single mom and like also who's picking up the kids as a couple, everyone picking up kids from school, unless it's kindergarten graduation day, is there alone. So she's having this memory of a time she was floating in the ocean. They would always do things like grab surfboards and then just float in the ocean, look around, paddle a boot. And she's like, that's what I loved about him. We were so spontaneous, always doing things like going to the ocean. And then suddenly out of nowhere, he goes, I'm going to take this wave. He says, letting go of me and positioning himself in the water. He checks over his shoulder and then executes three perfect freestyle strokes as the wave starts to front load. And she's like, so upset. She's like, wow. So he abandoned me. Listen, he is a dick. But is this it? Because suddenly he's like, okay, I'm swimming in. Yeah. I mean, the whole reason they're in the ocean is to wash the wine off that got spilled on her. This is the worst day of her fucking life, man. But then immediately she's like, I watch the sun go down and I have to get into it. And I'm like, I, I don't know. Okay. That tension between independence and security is churning inside of me here as I float alone in the water. I feel colder without Rory, but also more real. I'm aware that I've been acting like those superficial girls I was jealous of in high school. I'm surprised at myself. I didn't realize I had been harboring such a deep-seated need. It's clear to me now that Rory represents a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a do-over. What? A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a do-over? What are you talking about? This is such a pathetic chapter. I'm sorry. There's like no other way to talk about it other than like pure dripping sadness disdain i feel i sense disdain in your voice i have a lot of disdain because i think everything she's saying is pathetic so anyway things kind of get bad between them they start breaking apart they have less to say to each other also i want to say one thing that i find important is that like when they're floating in the water they would look at the beach houses and they would be like that's the beach house that we're going to live in when we get married and so that is just an important thing to remember for something I want to say later. Okay, so they start breaking apart. So they start breaking apart. She goes to Arizona for a weekend to like get over him and be like, no, I'm going to be single. I have to remember what I'm like by myself. Then he calls her and he goes, I have to tell you, the girl that I was dating before you and I got together and they were together for two years. He was dating her the whole time they were together. Also, two months ago, she gave birth to my son. <laughs> yeah, so he was cheating on her the entire time, fully had a baby with someone else. He also has two other daughters that Liz, like, mothered. So she drives back there furious. They get into a huge fight. He's like, listen, I'll do anything. Take me back. I'll be whoever you want me to be. I'll fix myself, blah, blah, blah. And she's, like, considering it. She's like, well, that would be great. If we had a version of this relationship where you just did whatever I told you, I would love that. 
And then she goes to the bathroom. And she gets a text from a man that she had gotten coffee with. And he erupts into a jealous rage. He goes, who is this? And she goes, I don't know, just like a friend I got coffee with. He goes, a date? She goes, it was coffee. And it was when we were broken up. And he freaks out and says, I can't believe you would do this. I'm not even ready to start dating yet. He says, drawing himself to his full height. And his she's like, tone you just is imperious. Had a baby with someone else. What do you mean you're not ready to start dating yet? He tells her, you need to leave now. They end up having sex twice. And then she cries for like a year. And she becomes so depressed because she's like, well, not only is there nobody out there for me, but I'll never be able to date again because I clearly have such bad taste in men. She stops going to therapy, which is always a telltale sign. That's when you need to most go therapy. And her therapist keeps calling every few weeks and being like, I'm just worried about you. And finally, she goes, if you're so worried about me, why don't you teach me to surf? And he goes, okay. So then they go surfing together every day for like a few months. Instead of doing therapy for free, he teaches her to surf. It, it empowers her. Being in nature is nice. She has like the same realization she had during the blizzard where she goes, oh my God, the world is beautiful. And then she also has this realization where she goes, oh my God, if we had lived in that beach house, the people who own big houses on the beach never live in them. They just stand empty and dark 11 months out of the year. Like the owners are just like sad, dreamless nothings. And I'm like, okay, that feels like an insane projection for like people who have a beach house. (laughs) I just feel like these projections to be like to stand alone at child pickup is pathetic. To own a beach house and be rich is pathetic. (laughs) To be passed out on the floor is pathetic. (laughs) To have one leg is pathetic. (laughs) Liz. (laughs) Uh, I was waiting for this chapter the whole time I was reading the book. I was like, where is it? Where is it? Here it is. 14 hashtag. This is the presidential medal of honor, Liz, because I think being a president is like (laughs) not honorable. (laughs) Being a president and being on the New York Times bestseller list are two things that used to seem like a big deal, but I guess just anyone could do it. Dead or alive, it doesn't even matter. (laughs) It's funny to be like, I'm running for president and I'm very much not dead and I have witnesses. (laughs) Uh, This country, it's funny. It's a funny country. I laugh every day when I'm crying. (laughs) Anyway, Presidential Medal of Honor, Liz, you wrote the most worthless piece of shit Me Too chapter in any memoir I've ever read. Congrats. Hard to do in this landscape. But you wrote some of the most meaningless drivel. Okay, so basically she goes, I got the call. A producer that I had previously been working with has been accused of a lot of counts of sexual assault. And she goes, okay, this is actually crazy because I have experienced so much inappropriate sexual advances from men in the industry, in my life. And she goes, what he did to me, I wouldn't even count as assault. So like, what are these girls talking about? Yeah, she's like, what the fuck? Like, it's so important that women use our voices to like protect other women. And because I've associated myself with this producer... I'm probably going to be asked to make a statement, which I like literally don't want to do. She's so worried. She's like, do I have to make a statement? Everybody knows I was going to make an album with him. Everybody knows it was randomly scrapped. Ugh. And it's just so crazy to sit here and be like, as women, the thing we can do to help other women is to use our voice. And I swear to fucking God, if you ask me to use my voice in this specific scenario, you're a bitch. And then she's like, listen, I can't believe this guy would do this. And then she goes, did he hit on me? Yes. Did I take him up on it? No. Is that why he lost interest in our record? Maybe. But that's not the main reason. The main reason is because that he was like mercurial and a jerk. And also, yeah, he often asked for nudes. And also, yeah, I did tell my friends I think he won't make my album because I won't sleep with him. But truth is, compared to the transgressions of other powerful, unscrupulous men, his behavior towards me was almost acceptable. He actually inspired me, which I liked. And sure, he pestered me about a photo of my ass and mentioned that he knew just what to do with my type of butt. But he also talked about books and space and Star Wars. I swear to fucking God, if you're sexually harassing a woman, but not intellectually, you're a loser. One thing that really jumps out to me about this reporting is how this man seemed to seek out and hone in on women who were in need of help somehow, who were insecure or a little lost for reasons. Whether that was because he could manipulate them more easily or because he related to that state himself, I don't know. I love that humanizing of him. She's like, God, maybe he found women who were feeling low because he felt so low. Or maybe it was because he knows those are the ones that you can absolutely assault. Maybe he is a literal predator. The thing that he has been accused of by many women and the law. And then she goes on to say, when he first approached me about making a record, I was floundering. I was in the dead zone career-wise. Much like someone who is low and might send a nude. Now I'm glad we never finished. I don't have to carry the stigma of his tarnished reputation when I look at my back catalog. I get to have sympathy because everyone can see how hard he was to accommodate. And my resistance to his control looks like good judgment. Okay. 
So she's like, I guess that winter before the article came out, he has posted on Instagram that he had just gotten out of rehab. And she calls her managers like, oh, that's so great. Should I ask him to finish this record? And the manager's like, oh, I wouldn't, but I can tell you why. My immediate concern was for his well-being. I thought about reaching out, but I'd been given the information in strict confidence and knew I couldn't contact him. I like don't know what she wanted to say here. She also then talks about like imagining what he would say when he read this essay. And what she wants to tell him is, you know how you always hate what I write at first, how when I'm confrontational, it offends and hurts you, but then you read it again later and realize it's not as bad as you think and you understand what I'm trying to say. Well, take another crack at this in a year or two and really listen. Don't just react to the assault on your ego. I'm defending you. I'm defending you when you're indefensible. Why? Imagine being like, I'm so worried about hurting this rapist's feelings. And then she keeps on being like, I can't believe I have to give a statement. Do I have to give a statement? And her manager's like, no. And she's like, I feel like I have to. And then she finds out all these girls quit music because of what this guy did to them. And her manager's like, can you imagine that's so horrible? Like, I can't even imagine if something like that happened to me when I was just so young and starting out. I probably would have quit music altogether. And she's like, well, they shouldn't have. And she's like, I don't know. Worst stuff happened to me all the time. And I made it. And again, I think, as Asha was saying, I think these are thoughts that a lot of people, I, I've had them in like, You know what I mean? There is that thing where hopefully it's always getting better. And so then it is hard to be like, well, I had it worse. And like, it's hard not to immediately want to feel like the victim, but you have to have that second thought of, no, the work isn't done till it's done for everyone. And just because he touched me with his bare dick and he only touched her with his boxer dick, she doesn't have the right to complain. Like, you don't get to say shit like that. And there's never that rectifying of that first bad thought in this book. Yeah, I feel like especially when I was younger and I was like defiant and like much less aware of like patriarchal structures and like racist structures and like all of these things, there are like thoughts you have that then you think back on and you're like, oh, that was wrong to think. Do you know what I mean? And so I can't imagine writing them down and then being like, anyway, this is what I think. As like an adult woman. There's a part where she's like, I saw that people are boycotting his music and I think that's going a little far. Just don't go to his live shows and then let him pay his due and he'll come back later. And I was like, why would you say, like, who are you to fucking tell people how they're allowed to react to like a serial fucking predator? You think they're overreacting? Especially to be like, let him pay his dues and come back later. You know that I'm of the firm belief that like no one gets to do the coolest jobs that everyone dreams of. Yeah. Yes, I believe in certain forms of redemption. And like, I'm not saying that nobody can do anything ever again. But when people are like, why won't you go see Louis C.K. live? He said, sorry. I'm like, first of all, he literally didn't say sorry. And second of all, like, you could just not. Most guys are wonderful, brave, self-sacrificing humans. Some of them are straight up heroes. The rest are a mixed bag battling their own psychological wounds and tormented pasts. Hashtag not all men. <laughs> Hashtag and even the bad ones are actually victims themselves. I wish the best for my producer. I hope he overcomes his issues and goes on to lead a fulfilling, healthy life with real love, humility, and acceptance in his heart. I wish the same for myself. But the women who have been hurt did not deserve to be taken for a ride. They trusted his word. Can you trust mine? What are you talking about? I literally can't trust your word. It seems like you're saying that if a rapist says sorry, you should say okay. Do women lie? Sure. Are uh, most women lying about their assaults? No. Can they prove it? Probably not. Predators are smart. They wait until somebody else is around before they start speaking crudely to you. That way, no one can call them out or bear witness to what was happening. I feel like I sound like an asshole. Like, I don't like how I sound when I'm talking about what a dumb bitch she is. Because everything she's saying is just like the opposite of anything that I think is helpful to add to any conversation. It just feels like to hear this from the woman who was like on guard at photo shoots. What happened to her? I don't know. Yeah. And then she goes, I'm afraid by writing this, I will lose professional opportunities. I have worked so hard to come as far as I have. It seems massively unfair that women should have to risk so much so that men can go through their awakening processes. She says at one point, she goes, I like thought I was doing such a good job by never complaining about the way I was treated. I cannot believe you think you're going to lose work for this chapter. This chapter where you won't even name the man that Rolling Stone named and are like, I hope you go on to have a good life. You're fine. She goes, there are a lot of us women out there changing the landscape, one heart and one pair of ears at a time. It's already better now than it was when I was growing up, and I'm benefiting from other women speaking out. So I guess it's my turn to contribute some of my fuel to keep the collective flame alive. Fuck it. Gather on the warmth and firelight. Let me fortify you for a while. What do you think you gave me in this chapter? What In what way do you think you contributed to a conversation? What did you speak out about? What did you say? Not all men. The guy who was outed in multiple articles that were well-reported, other women who spoke out, you're here to corroborate? an unnamed man that he didn't really do anything that bad to you, but uh, you hope he fixes himself. What do you think you did here? It made me actually irate. 
Okay. This next chapter is like the pinnacle of... Oh, this one is like actually insane. This book, I had no idea what to expect from Liz Fair. I could have come out of this book being like, she's an icon, a legend. I'm a stan. I thought we were going to get a Sheryl Crow light. Yeah. What we got is like Lena Dunham light. And in some ways, Lena Dunham heavy. So basically in this chapter, she's talking about the ripple effect from her breakup with Rory, where she like loses faith in herself, trust in herself. She like doesn't feel beautiful anymore. She feels transparent. She like moves through the world with just like this absolutely quaking insecurity. Her way of helping herself is she gets all dressed up and glamorous and she goes to Trader Joe's because there's a cute guy there who kind of looks like her ex Rory and they make eye contact and flirt sometimes. Yeah. And so she like loves this Trader Joe's cashier, which like, listen, man, we have literally all been there. But I don't know. Have you ever dressed up to go get attention from one? No. She has like a real thing with this Trader Joe's cashier where she's like, he definitely likes me. And one day she gets dressed up to go see him and he's not there. And she like asks this other person. She asks if she knows him. I finally muster the courage to let her see my need. Do you know if he has a girlfriend? I ask. Like I'm the kind of person who inquires about men all the time. Like I'm someone who behaves in a totally opposite way from how I actually do. Yeah, I think he does. She winces. Oh, well, I say shrugging. I can ask. She offers helpfully. No, please don't. Don't say anything. Don't even say I asked. Of course not. She's very understanding. I guess deep down that I know I won't find what I'm looking for in a Trader Joe's store, but I'm confused as to why he gave such special attention to me. I don't know you're famous. And also their job is to kind of be nice to you. Like if you say, hey, how's your day to everybody? And like 95% of the people go, good, you. And you say good back. And then somebody's like, Well, and they engage with you. They're going to go, oh, this person like is picking up what I'm putting down. We're going to have a little bit more of a human engagement. Yeah. And so he also like brings her a gift basket. But he has mentioned to her that he loves giving people presents. So she's like, I don't know like why he gave me this basket, but he does love giving presents. So like that's kind of a whole thing. So he gives her this gift basket for the holidays. And then he's like, can I get your number? And she goes, well, I didn't know how to say no. So I gave him my number. And then he called the next week and asked to, her to go to lunch. And she's like, well, what was I supposed to do? I had to go to lunch. I started this thing. So then she goes to lunch. And at lunch, he invites her to his wedding. And she's like, what the actual fuck? Like, this is the craziest thing anyone's ever done. And I'm like, okay, is it possible that he thought he was like platonically becoming friends with a musician he liked? I mean, it definitely is crazy. But I'm like, not as crazy as like getting dressed up as a famous person to go flirt with somebody at their job. Well, okay, here's what I'll say. I think it's like not the most normal thing to do, but I become friends with people because I like frequent where they work. I do think it's crazy. It's your first time hanging out on purpose to invite them to your wedding, your destination wedding. Yes, I agree. I think that if you've only hung out with someone once, you should never invite them to your wedding. I think that is the crazy thing. It seems to me like he was excited to make friends with a famous person who was outwardly engaging with him. To me, in any situation, you can't be like, he called me and asked me to hang out and I said, yes, how crazy is he? No, that I agree. Like she started this whole thing. Yes. She went in, dressed up, flirting and asking other people about his relationship status. And then is like, oh my God, I can't believe he thinks I have a crush on him. Yeah. And so then he asks her to his wedding and she's like, no, I'm not going to your wedding. And then she stops going to Trader Joe's. And then like a year later, she's there and the woman that she had initially inquired with to find out if he's single was like, oh my God, your friend killed himself. I saw myself from correcting her. There's no point. And this is about the idea that they were friends. She's like, well, we're not. But she just takes it. She's like, we just went to coffee once. We're not friends. And it's like, I don't know. Could you perhaps just be like, oh, this person that I knew and bantered with is no longer alive. Like, could that maybe be the takeaway from this moment? I realized that this guy whom I barely knew is now permanently part of my story. No, he's not. So that just for that to be your takeaway, be like, my story is now changed by you. I have no choice but to remember him. I'll bet a million bucks that that was part of the logic running through his mind when he decided to take his own life. The assurance that every person he'd ever helped or tried to get close to would be shocked, would reevaluate him after he was gone. We would all have to carry him with us in our memories forever, whether we wanted to or not. She is unhinged. That is such like a weird fucked up response to be like, oh, you were so depressed. You took your own life. (sighs) Manipulative. Now I guess I have to remember you. This chapter made me hate her. So now she's like, now when I see somebody at the Trader Joe's line who tries to chat, I try to chat with them back because you don't know. Maybe they're at their lowest. You don't know their struggle. The stranger next to you is so much more like you than you think. So now she starts going back to Trader Joe's because clearly the coast is clear. She doesn't have to worry about running into the guy that she tricked into liking her. 
And what does she develop? A new crush on a new Trader Joe's worker. But she says that she maintains like a steady boundary with him because she knows that you like can't be friends with your Trader Joe's cashier. And she says, it may not be fair or ideal, but these arbitrary divisions in society, customer versus worker, older versus younger, established versus just starting out, they exist for our own protection as much as to maintain the social order without meaning to. We sometimes scrape the safety layer off and end up penetrating one another's lives more than we intend to. Certain collisions, it turns out, are just too hard to take. I'm not saying you should abide by the rules that society lays out for you all the time, but I sure as hell recommend not flouting them headlessly. Just do your shopping and go home and cry in your pajamas like a winner. So is she saying... Like her takeaway was like, I should not have fraternized with the working class. Yeah. I think so. I will say like... I do think she underestimated how exciting it is for somebody to like meet a famous person. Yeah. And I do think that there is something to that, that when you have a clout to you, that the relationship dynamic and the power dynamic is not level from the start. So to be going after like this guy who worked at Trader Joe's, it was fucking weird of her to do. He obviously is someone who struggled with his mental health. Yes. And I do think there's definitely other people at Trader Joe's who are nice to him. I don't think he like built up something in his mind it is exciting to like project. I mean, think about when you go on a good first date and by that night you've imagined the house you're going to build and like Christmas tradition. Of course. And I don't think it's fair to project that, oh, wow, when you commit suicide, you're like forcing everyone you've ever no, interacted I think she's with insane. to like contend with you. Like that's so psychotic. I'm just trying to say like what this essay could have been about in a way that I would have given her credit for. Yeah. Her conclusion is weird. Her judgments are everything about this essay is weird. The fact that she went back and had a new Trader's Joe crush. I'm like, it's so weird. I really like can't believe this is like written down. She is one of Rolling Stone's best guitarists of all time. 153 out of 250. This last chapter is just like insane, depressing. She talks about like helping her mom clear the stuff out of her house because her parents are selling their house and moving into a care home. And she is like, it's so awful when you live in a retirement home, your life literally doesn't matter anymore. And so they're cleaning out their house and she's like, God, without their things, their like life wastes away as like forgotten memories. And I'm just like, what are you saying? I had such a hard time with this chapter. I was so annoyed and like over her. And she talks about when her grandma was dying, how she kept throwing tantrums and refused to see her because she didn't want to be complicit in her death. And I was like, grow up. Loving someone and being an adult means sometimes seeing them in a way you don't want to have to see them, but they need you. Yeah. And then she talks about going to this lecture where like most of the attendees of the lecture were old people. And so everyone was like kind of moving slowly. And she was like, I guess I was part of this group, but I was like the most beautiful person in the room because I'm young. She literally says that. I mean, she said that in the Trader Joe's copter. She goes, I have this way of just turning on it because I've been famous before. That comes in handy and I can just like be so beautiful in a room and get everybody's attention. And she's like this old man tripped and fell in front of everyone. And then he was so humiliated because when you're old, you have no dignity and it is humiliating to be old. And like, it's pathetic to be old. It's pathetic to only have one leg. It's pathetic to be lying down. And she's out. like, I wish I could have made him laugh. And she ends up like talking to him throughout the night, the old man who fell down. And she's like proud of herself for making him feel better. Okay, that is not the worst thing you've done. But the thing you could change about yourself is instead of like watching this old man fall and being like, that is humiliating. Being old is the most undignified thing that could ever happen to you. You could say like, why do I think that? Maybe I should change the way I think. <laughs> I mean, her whole life is on the spectrum or this binary of you're either humiliating or being humiliated. She has so much insecurities about like, do people pity me right now because I pity them. Can I read you this line about her making the old man feel better? She said, soon he's smiling. And I bet all the other old men in the room wish they'd gotten to sit next to the prettiest girl in the ballroom. And that's how you do magic. What a fucking sick thing to say. <laughs> anyway, so then she is talking about cleaning out her mom's house. She doesn't have decades ahead of her. She can't travel to all those places anymore. Her life is shrinking, not expanding. And every bit of her past that I throw away, however insignificant, is like a withdrawal from the dwindling bank account of her time here on Earth. That's intense. I know. Can you imagine your life is nothing but the things you collect? And when you have to downsize, your life actually disintegrates entirely. All those race t-shirts, all those free t-shirts and tote bags. When you throw them out, your soul dissipates. And then she's like, I guess we'll all get older. Can't argue there. And none of us will matter. 
I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of conclusions about like what can be done about our time here on earth. At one point, she's like, all you can do is be good to one another. And then she's like, actually, all you can do is cheat on your husband. And then she's like, actually, all you can do is collect things. (laughs) But only if boys like to touch them. (laughs) Anyway, I feel like I'm arguing with a lunatic. Like, I don't think anything I said made sense during this episode. I feel like she thinks it's like sleight of hand to never make a point. But I think actually it's good to have a thought. I guess I'm getting to a place where I like really admire people who say conclusions. Do you know what I mean? Like I was critiquing Sofia Coppola in a recent Patreon episode and I was like, I don't think she ever makes a point. And someone was like, that's the point. And I was like, actually, I don't think it's the point. I actually have that preference in art as well. I really respect, even if I disagree with your perspective, I really need like a passionate POV. I need you to like believe in something. Yes. I guess I'm like, why are you making art if you're like, well, I want you to think. And I'm like, I want to think about what you think. (laughs) When people are like, I don't know, here's just a story. Does it have any meaning? You tell me. And I'm like, no, you tell me because I gave you time. And actually, humanity is so beautiful and broken and painful. And if you don't even care enough to think something, then why should I waste my time hearing? I don't care. Yeah. I respect passion. I respect humanity. And I respect bravery and courage and commitment to an idea. Same. This was artsy fartsy. She thinks she's deep and actually she's whiny. She feels like someone with no female friends. I don't know. This felt very much like something the girl and like the guy hang wrote. And she doesn't know it's bad because nobody had to read it. Like no, she's like, guys don't read your stuff. You know that. And I'm like, someone should have read this. Someone should have been honest with you. For sure. Someone could have read it. How fertile would you consider this soil? 2.5. I would give it like a 1.9. Okay. I do feel every single sentence I wanted to dissect and be like, excuse me. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it like had anything in it. I would say there was a lot of soil, but I wouldn't consider it fertile. Can I tell you if right now I went into my refrigerator and I squirted a little bit of every single condiment that I have, like you can't see there's nothing in that bowl. Yeah, but like all that would grow is mold. That's something. That's life, baby. I don't discriminate. And (laughs) how many worm teenies would you like with her? Literally zero. I like don't want to know her. I like don't find her to be appealing or compelling. Amen. I think she does music for TV now. I love TV. Ain't that the truth? All right. And who do we love the most? Our five-star wormies. Bye, bitches.